show you all what we have. And this has a, it's been a fulfilling and very difficult semester creating the Kier Scarrow, but I would, I would do it all again. And we're gonna have some readers from Kier Scarrow go through and um, read some of their pieces. And we're trying to have somewhat of an assortment. So uh, let's just get right into it. So the first up is Robert, which I don't think he's here right now. He is here. Yeah. Oh, he is? Okay, sorry. Yeah, and just yeah. Uh, a quick caveat before we get started, a few notes. Uh, I have shared a PDF of the 2021 Kira file, so all readers should be able to access their work that way, and everyone should be able to get a sneak peek through that file. And we are recording this session for posterity, and so other people who couldn't make it can still watch the reading and celebrate with us after the fact. So when you are reading, if you could please make sure you, you are unmuted when reading and that your video is on if possible, so that that way that's captured on the recording. Um, but thank you for everyone uh, for coming and for all of the staff for being in here. And yeah, we'll have uh, Robbie uh, take it away. Hello, my name's Robbie. Um, the piece that I'm gonna be reading is Love is Frightening, which is the 2021 Valentine's Day contest piece I submitted. Um, should I just go right into it? All right, it's frightening. The thought of being brokenhearted when someone leaves you, they take a piece of your heart that you gave to them so bravely. It's frightening. The feeling that you'll get close, then lose the person that means the most. But I'm not afraid. I want to be the thief of her heart and the prince of her mind. It's frightening. She makes me want to jump, leap, and hope that I can fly. If I can't fly, I won't mind. If I hit the ground face down and broken, I won't care. It's frightening. I will simply get up, look at her, and think to myself, I know that what I know of her is new but what I want to feel will never get old. Thank you so much, Robbie. Okay, so the next person up is Maisie talking about her piece called Eric. Hi, I'm Maisie. Um, should I pull it up or is there any way we could get it? Oh, there we go. I'm going to bring it up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I like to draw. Um, usually I draw kind of sort of grotesque creatures more than anything. Um, so this drawing is actually a little more uh, pretty than what I usually go for. Um, and I actually drew it when I was in Europe over winter break uh, for ski races but uh, I hadn't been on snow for seven days, even though I had been there for a while and I was just feeling very stir crazy because we were trapped in our Airbnb. So I started drawing this um, and I wanted to draw something that like took up a lot of time. So I drew something that was sort of out of my comfort zone because like I said, I usually draw more monstrous things than this. Um, and that's also why I chose to uh, use stippling for shading, because that's very time consuming as well. Um, yeah, but I had a lot of fun drawing it. And yeah, I just used a pen and a notebook and that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Maisie, for speaking about that. And if whenever I'm speaking, you guys hear mo um, Lawn mowers, I apologize that they are right outside my window at this moment, and I did not know um, that they would do this today. So anyway, so next up is Caroline Hoy reading A Dream's Rose. Caroline, are you here? Okay, I think she is frozen. So we're gonna move on to Samuel Westland reading a page out of his fiction piece called The Wrong Turn. 
Okay, let me unmute and bring up that page on here. All right, so now, um, yeah, because I already, already have it pulled up. All right, so I think if I just click here. Um, oh, no, no, that's, that's not it. Yeah, I already had it on here, but it looks like it's not on there anymore. Okay. Okay, so y'all of you can see that? Yes, I brought it up for you, Sam. Okay. It's like I had it I had it on this page before, but it looks like it left this page. All right. Anyway, I'm I will anyway, uh I'm Samuel Westland. I'm the one who wrote Wrong Turn. Uh and what I did in there was a technique called a perspective shift, and that allowed me to put the reader in the shoes of the character in the story and it made it feel more uh well, it's not supposed to feel realistic because it's fiction, but it's supposed to be. Uh, when the reader's reading it, they're supposed to be able to see it and hear it and even feel it in their mind. And that helps uh, make that easy. That makes it easier to do, starting with a perspective you don't typically use in a story and then shifting to their preferred perspective. In my case, that's second person, the method is third person, so I had to start with first person. Anyway, if I can find it now. All right, here it is. That's the picture that went with it, but I'm not seeing the story. Anywhere. Sam, I have it up on the screen. If you tell me where you're gonna start for your reading, I can have it here for you. Okay. Yeah, I'll just go back to the I'll just go back to this screen. I was trying to look on the other screen. I wasn't finding it. But yeah, well, I do. But yeah, I like to write. Yeah, I like to draw. I like to I have a lot of outdoor hobbies to the too, but I don't really do that very much anymore now that I'm working and going to school. I'm mostly indoors now. But, and I don't have a car anymore. Okay, so anyway, this is page one of Wrong Turn. This was the one I wrote for the Halloween contest. And I'll start at the beginning since we're doing one page. And you know the way I like to start, I like to start with the action first and then kind of explain the action later in the story. So that kind of help, helps draw the reader in. Anyway. You'll never leave this town alive. As the claws of branches and brambles tore at Tyler's skin and clothing, the words from the women back at the station flash through his mind like a little, like a line from a half-remembered song. He should never have stopped at that gas station. Another howl toward the night, and below the rasp of his own ragged breathing, Tyler could hear growls and snarls, the sound of massive, powerful bodies crashing through the brush behind him. They were getting closer. Behind him, the beast's glowing red eyes bobbed and weaved through the trees and underbrush. This was it, he thought. A head on orange glow filtered through the shadowy silhouettes of the trees. And even, through, even though he feared another trap, the spark of hope drove Tyler in the direction of the eerie light. Light meant civilization. Civilization meant safety. So he ignored his apprehension and forced his weary body to press forward. Why did I have to stop? Why didn't I keep going? As he ran through the gauntlet claw-like thorns and branches, Tyler's mind flashed back when he had first arrived in the haunted valleys of old Kentucky. And, it, and of course, it uh, originally it had a page break right there. I'm just going to stop there. But there'd been a page break there originally, and it kind of, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you, Sam, very, very much. Um, next up is Carrie Labonte. I hope I said your last name right. Um, reading her piece called Flower. Hi guys, so I'm Carrie and I'll be reading Flower. We begin as a flower growing big and tall, loving and soaking up the sun until the storm came, washing the dirt from the roots, exposing the foundation, 
till the bloom died. The plant left rotting in the mud, once a beautiful bloom, now becomes a rotten puddle of flesh, giving back its soul to the soil. Over the frosty winter, the seed remained dormant. The spring light shined down through the chunky soil. Again, the flower bloomed in all its beauty. Thank you, Carrie, very, very much. Um, I believe Caroline has been unfrozen. Caroline, are you unfrozen now? Yeah, sorry, the internet's bugging out. Oh, no, but you're I completely it. fine. Awesome, cool. Are you ready to read a Dreams of Rose? Dreams yes. Rose? Okay. Yes. So. so this is my poem, A Dreams Rose. There once was a little girl. The girl, she had many dreams. But every year on four, February 14th, a rose is what she dreamed of. A special pink rose. The girl loved pink. She dreamed a boy would gift her gift the rose to her she wished for she wished for very much a singular pink rose on valentine's day not chocolate she wasn't a fan not a large bouquet of flowers too much attention for her the girl simply wishes for a pink fresh lovely smelling thornless rose the girl would have no the rose would have no thorns. When the girl sees the rose, she, uh, she will beam big. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a little bit breathless. That, that it, the, 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 just a minute. What? My computer's being annoying and not wanting to show things properly. Um, the girl will take the rose and put, and put it in her dirty blonde hair it will be simply hidden. It will be the, the I'm, I'm having trouble reading. Um, it will be slightly hidden from her uncontrollable knot problem. The rose will match her simple pink dress. The girl will have wished upon shining stars, thrown pennies and wells and picked all the petals of the sunflowers. When her wish comes true, she will know all the wishing it will have been, it will have been worth every second what on valentine's day one of her biggest dreams will come true will come to the end of the tunnel she will be happy it will be a happy ending at least this dream will be a happily ever after thank you very much caroline and so next up, we're going to be reading Sarah's a section of her play, and I trust that she picked a good part of what she wanted to read. So um, take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to give you all a bit of background first. Um, so the excerpt I'll be reading is from a longer play that I'm currently working on. It's a dark comedy set in the fictional island town of Peevishly, where two technically unlicensed surgeons, Gotha and Injury, actually named Injury, practice medicine together when no one else would have them. Injury's exclusive interest is in amputation, specifically the parts that are cut off. Injury also has a stutter, but the stutter disappears when he lies. Years ago, Gotha quit peevishly in disgrace and joined injury's practice, um, kind of accounting for what injury lacked in actually caring for his patients rather than their removed arms. This is much the state of the universe until it is disturbed by the scene I'll read from when a plague uh, puts injury and Gotha at odds with one another. And if you want to bring it up, it's totally okay. If not, um, we'd be beginning on page 57. Uh, but I will be hopping around a bit just to get the gist all out with this excerpt. All right, I'm already in the spot. <clears throat> the first speaker will be injury. You can tell his, he's different from Gotha by his stutter. That should be fairly obvious. So yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm bored out of my mind when I'm uh, trapped here. 
Well, what can I do about that? You're a surgeon who refuses all but one type of surgery. I can't help that people don't come barging in here, eager to have you take off their... I'm sorry. <sighs> For which part? Of course, we do still have the moral dilemma in that you've been setting traps for the neighbors. You're only so lucky we don't have many. And offstage, there's the sound of a metallic snapping shut and a young man, Petrarch, wailing in pain. I was saying, Gotha, you must go and see who that was. Oh, Christ, injury, you put the peanut butter out. Peanut butter? Never mind, I'm sure it's all the same to him. Get me that crutch in the closet. Here's a knocking indeed. Stay the door, brave soul. Be with you in a uh, moment. Hallo, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, so deeply sorry. But you're doctor, Cecil Sivanis van Goethe, and you've stepped in a bear trap. Come right in. We're doctors, you know. A doctor, you know about this? <laughs> all too well. Just what you think it is. Sit here. All right now, boy, w what is your name? Petrarch. Petrarch, really, Petrarch? Well, I'm not even going to begin delving into the apocalyptic implications of that. Uh, but friends call me Petty for short. Rather petty of them. Injury, for the love of God, keep silent. Oh God, just settle down now, Petty. No, I, I just thought neither of you have it, have you? What are you talking about? The pox, the disease, whatever it is going around, you have heard of it. No. <sighs> Try to keep things in perspective. Injury, my glass of water for the lad. No, thank you. But really, we're not supposed to drink out of anything someone else has touched. Please get us a clean glass, injury. Now, tell me, please, Petty, what is this disease you mentioned? It's killed eight people already. That may not be a lot wherever you hail from, I guess. I'm from town. I'm native to Peevishly. Oh, really? Anyway, that's not a lot to many people, but it's only been three days, and you know how small a place we are. I mean, they talk about it like it's terror alive, really. I'm not allowed to make any deliveries after today. We're all going to hole up in our houses, just like the end of the whole world. How's it manifest? What are the symptoms? And about your deliveries. Right, right. I'm your new postman. Good God, I nearly forgot. Did you have something for us? <laughs> Page switch. Um, yes, outside. I should, you keep still. Injury, would you retrieve the mail Petty brought us? I think he more than probably dropped it somewhere near the front door. You were saying. I was? Symptoms. Oh, well, it's a wasting disease, they say. Starts in your hands, feet, feels like arthritis, even turns your skin red like it. Then it tears up your insides, though people have different stories, just what that feels like. Some describe it like pneumonia, that, that lungs and you can't breathe. Either that or, yes, spat in the water I gave you. He was only joking, Petty. I should be going anyway. We're officially quarantined at sundown. Quarantined? What is it? I have no idea. Thank you very much, Sarah. I actually didn't know you had some accents in some of your characters, so that was really, really cool to see. And I love the acting. Thank you very, very much for doing that. Um, so next up is Emma reading Religious. Hi, I'm Emma Line. Um, okay, so I tried to kill, to kill God before he could kill me. He sent loving characters played by actors I should have known were just not realistic. They took turns on my body, but all at once, and I watched them stumble on lines and then felt their consequences alone. I shouldn't have lived. He had an infatuation with my suffering. It didn't stop. I couldn't rid myself of the arms that reached from my face, my eyelashes, my lips. In an attempt to destroy the very essence of my creator, I killed every love I ever had. I lost sight of who the actors were. I killed the souls of the ones who were created with purpose. 
I screamed fire until I taste iron in my lungs. I breathe it and scream as he still pretends he can't hear. Thank you very much, Emmeline. And so now I'm going to be reading my personal piece called Real Gone that is on page 35, I believe, on or 38. And as y'all read, um, as I read, I hope y'all following along. So this poem was inspired by a Tom Waits album called Real Gone. And this was a very, very prominent musician in my childhood. So kind of taking y'all through some of that. So here we go. Okay. I remember this CD. My father had it along with every other Tom Waits album. I was afraid of his collection, particularly this one. Real Gone felt like a satanic artifact. Its letters rose so slightly it felt alive. I'm gonna take the sins of my father, he said. That's all he knew, that's all you came to expect. He always hid himself beneath the devil's masks as he hoisted the bottle to his lips. His voice drowned in bourbon. That was an occurring sound within the home, making it seem like demons were around every corner. I'm just a trampled rose, dead and lovely. But when you grow older, you realize you have already had a taste of what life is really like. You undesirably numb yourself, making it easier to listen to the devil. Yep, and there we go. And hopefully, Elaine, are you able to read those of kiddos? Yeah, actually, it's funny. I was, um, you know, this poem um, is about meditation, and my meditative practice uh, amped up a ton when I had kids, or at least I, I felt like it needed to. It was always tough to make time. So this poem is about going through, you know, you have to get through tough things, and on the other side, things do calm down. I thought it might be kind of apropos if my kids are yelling potentially in the background while I read this because it's what it's all about. Like it's usually crazy. And I use this practice to kind of center myself despite the insanity. So um, I apologize in advance if it disrupts all of you, but it kind of goes with the purpose of the poem. The poem is called Wayfinding. Silence at daybreak, so rare and quite the gem. What do you have to say? I'm here to listen, to practice, to grow with zealous anticipation, only calmed by the promise of peace. The motherland I crave day in, day out through the waves of the tumultuous way, which leads me to you. Through the seas, navigating to peace. All I want from the stars and the sky is the earth that beats endlessly, calling me home where calm waters reward my journey. The same waters that thrashed now gently invite my boat to shore. Thank you so much. And I love it how we kind of like went through your mind process of creating this piece with like your kids around and like understanding that meditation is a very, very important part. So thank you so much. That was honestly really, really cool. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Michaela, for going through um, all, introducing all of our readers. Uh, I, we wanted to keep this celebratory but brief. We know everyone has very busy days, especially with these last few weeks of the semester. Um, but I would be remiss if we weren't also able to celebrate our editors and our wonderful editorial team that made Curious Hero happen this year. Um, we had a very large dedicated team. And so I just wanted to highlight all of our wonderful editors. And if you could feel free to use, you know, clap if you want, or use a reaction um, as uh, we, you know, celebrate the editors and all of the hard work we've done. So first is our editor in chief and managing editor for the entirety of the academic year, Michaela Smith. Michaela worked tirelessly to start Curious Furo essentially from the ground up this year. We really did a hard reboot on the journal and really built everything from the ground up uh, this year. And so Michaela's leadership really, I think, helped keep our team centered and on uh, and on focus and on task. So thank you, Michaela. Uh, Michaela was also awarded at honors and awards uh, yesterday and was also um, awarded an outstanding, outstanding service to Kiroskiro award as well. So please extend your 
Uh, congratulations Thank to you. her. Uh, and next we have our art and design team. And that was headed by Emmeline Grennan and Kim Caldwell, um, who did the enormous work of creating our InDesign file from scratch and are still in the process of the back and forth with KDP to make sure KDP is happy to accept our file. We promise that the print version of Kiriskiro is coming. I think a PDF right now is actually a little bit more pandemic friendly. And we really hope in the fall to have our full input, you know, our printed out version and to celebrate that way in the fall where we can all gather together again. Um, so please, you know, commend um, Emmeline and Kim for all of their work and the work that they're still doing now. Um, also part of our art and design team, our assistant editors, uh, Vince Davis, Jalen Hall, Deshante Kirkland, and Damon Rouse also helped um, tremendously in helping to choose the art and to provide um, feedback for the manuscript many times. So thank you to the assistant editors there. And for many of them, it was their first time ever working on a lip journal uh, and they all, uh, really did a fantastic job and worked hard to uh, make it all happen. So thank you to our art and design team. For our genre team, our head editors for poetry and theater and fiction and nonfiction respectively are Sarah Hajowski and Carrie Labonte. And they just did fantastic work, selecting work for the journal, helping with the editing process and getting everything together. Um, so thank you so much to our head editors on that team and our assistant editors who did a lot of the tedious proofreading work, maybe the stuff that isn't quite so glamorous, but is just as important um, in the editorial process. Maisie Hayden, Robbie Massey, Remy Strickland, and Sam Westland. So thank you to you all for working with Sarah and Carrie to put together all of our different uh, genres for the issue. And last but not least, our social media team, which was headed up by Caroline Hoy, putting together our first ever Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts, also helping to do the digital archive uh, of past Kiriskiros and confettis. So we're actually building a digital archive similar to what the Clarion has. And I know Caroline and her team have spent countless hours already at the copy machine scanning. Um, and she was assisted this semester by Erin Butts who helped with social media and the digitization process. All uh, wonderful work from our social media team. Uh, so thank you all. As you can see, we had a large editorial staff this semester, which is fantastic. We hope to continue that tradition in the fall. So if you have a friend or know anyone or yourself who wants to join Kiris Hero staff for the 2021-2022 academic year, we really encourage you to do so. Um, I'm sure any of these folks here would be happy to tell you it's a really wonderful um, and practical experience too. Um, and Caroline in the chat is noting, you know, come follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're BC Curoscuro at both places. So please give us a like or a follow. And I'm sure we'll be posting updates over the summer as well and featuring our issue um, as it becomes a real object. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to you, you know, read through the PDF, share that with folks, and then an announcement will come when the print issues are available. Michaela, was there anything else you wanted to add before we... Uh, said farewell for today? No, um, just that it's been an honor to serve in something that I felt very, very passionate about writing to me. Like I'm a psychology major, which is kind of like creative writing is a left turn from where I'm at because I'm very scientifically minded. Um, but I would think that writing is a source, like is a free source of therapy and is one of the most important things that anybody could do because it's like writing your secrets down on paper and it's safe there. And so I got into writing because I wrote to make myself feel better and power, like the power of writing can really give you power in your life and help. So just wanted to give y'all um, kind of a feel that this was my baby. And I'm very, very proud that of what we've accomplished, even though we're still de dealing with KDP stuff, but I'm still very, very proud of everything we've done. So thank you all for being here today and taking the time out of your busy schedules. 
Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you, Michaela. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for everyone who is able to attend. Thank you to the support from the English department, from the humanities division, and we'll be collaborating more in the future with the fine arts division next year as well. Um, so we continue to strengthen those partnerships and make Kiriskiro the best it can be. Um, so with that, if people wanna stick around and chat for a little bit after, you are more than welcome to, I'll keep this open. But if you need to head out for your busy day, feel free to, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.